All right, as those who are fifth grade and under are being dismissed, um, I just want to put a reminder that next week is our Family Fifth Sunday. If you don't know what that is, it basically all the kids besides nursery, like uh, three and under, get to stay with us for the whole service, which, of course, our kids, you know, may or may not like. But we like them being here, and it's super important, we know, that for families to, to worship together. And the family that worships together is oftentimes faithful to continue to worship together. And so we want to take the fifth Sunday of each month to not dismiss them to their classrooms as great as they are, as much as they love them, but to bring them or keep them here with us for a little bit longer. So just put that on your radar for next week. Also, um, if you have looked in your bulletin and you realize that we have once again lied to you. I am not Pastor Sean, and that is not the message that we're going to be sharing today. Um, so Pastor Sean got that pulled away on uh, a uh, urgent but you know personal family matter, and so he'll be back next week. But he had to to skip out to town and um, go back to Ohio for a few days, and so um, you can give him your prayers, and he'll be back, and he'll be able to start the new series with you. Um, so this is going to be just kind of a, a one-off uh, word together. But before we do, uh, let's pray once more time. Kind Father, uh, we invite your presence here. As we open your word and as we we read from it, as we declare its... uh, Open our hearts to your word. Encourage us in in the truth of who you are, in the truth of your your scriptures, and in in the path forward that you have for us. Come, Lord, and in between each word that I speak, Spirit, speak. Interpret to our hearts all that you desire to say to us this morning. We pray in the wonderful and the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So not, you know, just learning that I was going to be preaching today. I didn't have a a ton of time um, to to be able to develop and construct and think about what I was going to say. Um, But I felt the Lord call me to really uh, draw some work that I've been and this year, the, the Lord's really been impressing upon my heart the book of Daniel. Uh, and not just, you know, the, you know the, the book, but how it relates to a, a theme that runs throughout the scriptures. A theme of exile. What is exile? Well, it's, it's being cast from your home. That perpetual feeling of homesickness, if you will. When was the last time you felt homesick? may have been a while. Only for the first time, and, uh, and as once the excitement of the new, you know, everything going on died down, you, really, you realized, perhaps for the first time, that I actually miss my parents. I miss my siblings. I miss my friends. I, I miss the, the normalcy of life back home, but I'm here. For others, it might be, you know, we were the you may have been deployed or away on a business trip, and it's one of your children's birthdays, and you wish that you could be there, but you can't. Or you're away from home, and you are at that moment and that time. There's also another for it. It's uh, Farnve. Uh, don't be impressed. My German is terrible. Uh, but it's rather than homesickness, it's far sickness. It's, the, it's a homesickness for a place where you've never been, whether real or imagined. It's like longing to be at Hogwarts or Narnia or sit on the, the grazing uh, pastures of the Shire. And yes, you know you can never do that, but there's something about you, there's something about that life that calls you and draws you. And perhaps you've never heard of far sickness before, but you may have felt its inkling at some times. You're supposed to. You're supposed to, to have this homesickness for a place that you've never been. And the scriptures to tell us, declare to us a story of homesickness. Because we are exiles. We've been thrust from the garden. You know, we've been cast out from God's idyllic existence of paradise. And we're living east of Eden. Perhaps sometimes when tragedy strikes, injustice, you know, uh, rears its ugly head 
and we, we, we hear the, the echoes of Eden reverberating in our soul about this world and how it's not what it should be. Or perhaps the other side, it's not when injustice strikes, it's when the good times come and you realize how fading and fleeting and empty the best things are living east of Eden. So Tolkien, you know, the guy who, who wrote the, the Lord of the Rings, you know, he wrote elsewhere, he says, certainly there was an Eden on this very unhappy earth. We all long for it. We're constantly glimpsing it. Our whole nature at its best and least corrupted, its gentlest and most human, is still soaked in this sense of exile. Through sin, we were cast out of the place that is our true home. And we have this homesickness for it. But more than that, there's a particular, there's another sense of exile, a particular one. And it's living within a, a hostile, dominant culture. Living in a culture that, well, you are not free in, in at some sense to be all that God has called you to be. And if you've... Um, <clears throat> For the past couple decades, I, I think the church is awakening to this idea, this fact. That as faithful believers, as Christians, we are moving into a time of exile within our community. Within our country. That we are, that the dominant culture of the United States of America is hostile to the way, the rule, and the reign of God. No longer are we just considered, you know, uh, the, uh, the innocent, you know, naively kind uh, but strange neighbor like a Ned Flanders next door as we try to, you know, follow the Christian, you know, the Christian way. Now, in, in many circles, we are dangerous social pariahs who look to destroy and disrupt the social order. Right? We are thrust from, in some ways, from the, what the dominant culture says is, you know, the true way. We are called to, to give obedience to its, own, to its own moral ethics. We are called to compromise Christian convictions. We are called to do all these things in order to be considered good citizens. Gone are the days our Christians condemned for not adhering to the scriptures, but for adhering to their scriptures. Men like Brendan Eich, the, uh, the, CEO, the former CEO of uh, Mozilla Firefox, but he was ousted from his job because he, had, he dared to support the view of marriage. Businesses harassed and destroyed and taken to court because they dared to stand up to, to someone trying to pressure them to compromise a Christian conviction. Others being called to be fired and ousted and deplatformed because they dare to, to not uh, comport themselves to the mob mentality. This is exile. And while that's the bad news, the good news is this. Most of our scriptures are written by exiles and for exiles. This is not a departure from normalcy, but it is a return to normalcy for the people of God. And we have at our fingertips a wealth of wisdom and understanding of how to navigate faithfully in a world that may be hostile to who we are. Hostile to our claims of who the world's true ruler is and hostile to what it means to live faithfully before him. And so if you would, turn in your Bibles to uh, Daniel chapter 1. If you did not bring your Bible or you would like a, a guest Bible to follow along in our translation, it, we're in the NLT, and it's going to be on page uh, 708. We're going to be in Daniel, Daniel chapter 1. So, starting at verse 1. And during the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over Jim, or King Je Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God 
So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. So, well, as we enter into the opening lines of, of, this, of this book, we're set the scene with uh, an event that, well, future readers would know all too well. It's the first of a series of deportations of the people of the land of Judah. Uh, this particular one was 605 B.C., and Babylon came in, subject, subjugated and subdued God's people in Judah, took captives, drug them hundreds of miles from their fe- uh, friends and family to a land that they did not know. They plundered the temple of God. They took his holy objects and they thrust them in, you know, in the house of their own God as trophies of one more God they've destroyed. You can hear them singing you know, the, the Chris Tomlin tune to their own uh, thing, right? Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Bell, you are higher than any other. One more God. He sits under your feet. His objects, your plunder. You O Bel, O Marduk, O uh, Nebo, you are the one who is the conqueror of nations. You are the one who goes before us. Yet God's people are called to to remain truthful to to the witness that we have here. And while what the Babylonian tabloids would write about the, the efficacy of Bel and the inefficacy of Yahweh, what we have here is, is a different story of what's happening. It is the fulfillment of God's word to Moses, to the prophets, to Isaiah, who prophesied a hundred years earlier what was going to happen to God's people, that Babylon was going to come in. He was going to take away their stuff. He was going to take their men and make them eunuchs. He was going to do all this. Why? Because the people's hearts continually forsook him, continually worshipped other gods, continually did all these things. And what we, so what we have here is what one commentator writes is the severe faithfulness of God. That God's faithfulness, yet, and we, we often think of God's faithfulness as his faithfulness to save, but what we have here is his faithfulness to deliver the punishment that he promised his people. The severe faithfulness of God. That he would do just Head. Right, what do we see in verse 2? It is not the conquering of Yahweh that leads to the exile of his people. What we have is this, Yahweh gave them to him. Yahweh sends his people into exile. He sends them there to prune them, to purify them, to empower them. In his severe faithfulness, he sends his own people, even though he suffers shame for it. Even though the nations talk about his inability to save, his inability to measure up to to all the gods of the Babylonian pantheon. No, Yahweh sends them anyway to fulfill his word to his people. So if the Lord sends us into exile... It is the Lord who sends us into exile. It is not the inability of God to be faithful. It is the the manifestation of his faithfulness if he sends his people into a culture that does not receive them. So if the Lord sends us there, it's the Lord who sends us there. But there's a threat in exile. So if you, let's keep reading. Verse 3. So then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, or chief of the eunuchs, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, good-looking young men, he said. Make sure that they're well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens, and they were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter his royal service. 
Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. And the chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar. Hananiah was called Shadrach. Azariah was called. So what we see here is as, as God's people are taken into exile, well, there's, there's a threat of exile. You see, you know, while Daniel and, and company were perhaps among some of the more fortunate ones, if you can read between the lines, you see, you see what Nebuchadnezzar is wanting to do. It's not simply to educate them, it's to re-educate them. To bring them for three years of training of the, all the Babylonian way the world is. All the, all the stories about their gods and who they are and how they are supreme over all things. It's to bring them into the years of training to going to uh, you know the Babylonian seminary and to relearn all that they were supposed to learn. We see the the attempt to well not just bring the Jews into Babylon but to bring the Babylon into the Jews to transform who they are and their whole identity. some attention. In the northwest of China, for the past three years or so, uh, about a million and a half to two million people have been taken into to concentration camps. Mostly Uyghur Muslims. The men, they, they round up and shave in order to humiliate them. The women, they sterilize them. Kill off this species of people. And just a couple weeks ago, the Guardian, a British news, uh, newspaper, uh, posted a, a story written, you know, by someone who experienced, you know, two years in one of these Muslim or uh, these Uyghur concentration camps. And you know, she writes that, you know, while her husband and and family grew up in in China, they left because, you know, just as well. Most jobs, they would say, Uyghurs need not apply. Right. Frustrated, they left and went to France to find, find work, and they lived there for a while. But, but the woman who wrote it, Gobahar Hatawaji, forgive me if I mispronounce that, uh, you know, she couldn't bear the thought of trading in her, nat- you know, her, you know, her national identity. She wanted the opportunity to be able to go back and see her aging parents at some point. And so she never, you know, revoked her citizenship. You need to come back to... to and she tries to allow them to, you know, use a, a, a former friend who has power of attorney for her. And they're like, no, 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 you have to come. All right, she decides to go and... But upon going there, they, they bring her into an interrogation room and they accuse her and her family of terrorism. A picture of her daughter was seen with some other, you know, Uyghur Muslims in, in France, you know, holding a, a, a flag that's a symbol of their, I guess, uh, th- their movement to, to become uh, distinct from China. considered terrorism. Denied her any involvement water was any part of it, yet they, they still, they took her to a concentration camp. And for days, they, you know, they put her through physical and psychological abuse. And they would, you know, have them in rooms having to do exercises until, you know, some people would collapse. They'd be ripped up off the floor and slapped awake. And then if they collapsed again, they would be taken away and what she, to never be seen again. 20 days, she t- recounts being tied or chained to her own bed for, a pun- for punishment for which she has no idea what she did. Eventually, they take her from just the, you know, the, the physical abuse to, to start to the re-education process where they, they bring dormitory, which all there was a window with its metal shutter always closed. Two cameras uh, panning back and forth. 
forth in high corners of the room. That was it. No mattress, no furniture, no toilet paper, no sheets, no sink, just two of us in the gloom and bang of heavy cell doors slamming shut. And so for, and then during this time for 11 hours, they would be taught. They would be forced to, to profess their allegiance to Xi Jinping, to condemn their, their family, their friends, their, their way of life, to, to confess to, or a forced confession to, to crimes. And, and even, and the slightest mess up an opportunity for beatings and humiliations. And at the end of it all, she said this, we were ordered to deny who we were, to spit on our own traditions, our beliefs, to criticize our own people who are, are no longer we are shit. our souls are dead. I was made to believe my loved ones, my husband and my daughter were terrorists. Now what Daniel and his friends experienced was a lot was like this but also not like this it was done with a smile but the demand was just as absolute yeah they were given some privileges they were given some status some rank but the demands of of changing who they were remained like her under the for years of the mythos of the dominating perhaps they have identity changes to, to change who they are and how they think about the world as you see what happened with their names right it, it, they changed their names and why is that now good Hebrew names very often they're going to end or sometimes begin with you know El or Aya L is going to be, you know, short for, stand for God, and I is going to, is short for Yahweh, and so you have Daniel, which means God is, the and his name is changed to Belteshazzar. May Bel protect his life. Hananiah, Yahweh is gracious, becomes Shadrach, the command of Aku, the moon god. Mishael, who is what God is, becomes Meshach. Who is what Aku is? And Azariah, Yahweh has helped, has become Abednego, servant of Nebu, the god of wisdom. Right? These aren't just changing their names for fun. It is, it is fundamentally wanting to change and alter the identity of who they are. Of the, their names that were subtle hat to, to their faithfulness to Yahweh be, are changed in order to be hat tips to the Babylonian pantheon. And so, just because it's done with a smile, just because it's done with some pleasures, doesn't make it any less a totalizing desire to, to not just take the Jew out of ba or take the Jew to Babylon, but to bring Babylon into the Jew. You are not to be Daniel. Delta Shazar. Our culture, in many ways, is demanding such total desire, uh, total you know, identity transformation for the people of God. And in many ways, this is why we are sent into exile, is we have complied. We have given ourselves to materialism, satisfaction to independence from the way and the rule and the reign of Yahweh our king but its demands are total and all of us are going to be called at some level to bend the knee to the way of the world and the culture it is what uh, Rod Dreher calls a soft uh, totalitarianism that we are entering into at this time. And yes, we, might, we, we may not be feeling it completely yet. We may have our pockets of existence where we're you know, living faithfully and praising the name of Jesus. Uh, that's no I. 
But more and more, we realize, well, you know, they can, the, the culture can accept, you know, a vague sense of a religious identity. It can, wa- it can nod and wink at that. At the end of the day, it shakes its fist. It glares at a real Christian conviction on how to live in this world. So how does the Christian fight? How does the Christian move forward in a culture that is becoming increasingly and ever overtly hostile to our claims about the rule and reign of God over our lives? Well, let's keep reading. Start at verse 8. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the, chief of, by, uh, by the king. He asked the chief of staff for, per, for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel, but he responded, I'm afraid of my lord, the king, who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. And if you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. So Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He says, Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water. And at the end of 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. That Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. And God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings and visions and dreams. And when the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them. And no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. And whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. And Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. So I'm going to give you three ways that the Christian is called to proceed in this world. To remain faithful to the rule and reign of God amidst the the hostility of a larger, broader culture. The first is this. A life of self-denial over self-expression. Daniel took a pretty big risk and his friends to, to deny... <clears throat> the, the food offered by the king. Now, most of us, when we're reading this, we assume that the reason that he denied this is because it goes against the law of God. And we generally assume that because, well, we don't necessarily know what God actually required of Jews in terms of eating kosher. But there, there's not really the biblical evidence to suggest that that this food defiled because it violated God's law, right? Uh, I mean, he says he doesn't want to eat the meat, but is it because it's unkosher meat? Well, we don't know that. I'm sure some of it was probably kosher. Maybe he thinks that it's uh, been offered to idols, but who's to say that the vegetables weren't offered to idols? And why does he deny wine? Wine isn't unkosher. Wine's perfectly acceptable. And in fact, when you read later in the book of Daniel, you come to chapter 10, you realize that that Daniel had begun eating these things and he's giving them up again for a three-week fast. You know, the delicacies, meat, and wine. These things, they defiled, not because they were against the Jewish law, they defiled because they were, well, they grabbed a Jewish heart. They defiled because they were part of the good life. They were the delicacies to to eat and to drink and to consume. 
Wine in no way is, is going to be against Jewish law, but he denies it anyway. Why? Because he realized, Daniel, in his wisdom, realized what was happening. The, the Babylonian, you know, uh, well, re-education process, it came with a smile, and so he denies the smile. He denies their ability to seduce him into become the Babylonian way of life. He denies the perks of his position while accepting its abuse. Very often, if you're like me, we're, we're okay with the perks. We like the perks. We love the perks. It's, it's the, the ability to, to squash our self-expression that we don't like. We don't like you know, being forced in the classrooms. We don't like having our name changed. We don't like somebody telling us what we're supposed to believe and, you know, who we're supposed to do. But we, the perks, oh, we like the perks. But Daniel realized something. If I'm going to take the perks, the perks are going to take me. And so often we give ourselves and we, you know, we allow the perks of this life, the perks of living in America, the perks of living in Babylon to seduce us. We have no qualms of turning on the TV and letting it, uh, well, speak to us the, the, the mythos of our age again and again and again. We have no hesitation to go on our phones every other second and check what the, the latest thing in our Facebook feed or Instagram posts say. They're slowly but surely seducing us into the way and the vision of the world. And I'm not saying that we need to, you know, never be on Facebook or watch TV or anything, but it's the perks that seduce us. It's these little inklings that, that fill our, our brains with dopamine and say, hey, that's, that's good. But slowly but surely changes who we are. And Daniel realized that if I'm going to be faithful, when I, I can't deny these objects of subjugation. If I do, I'm going to be dead. But I can deny these, enticing, these enticements. The second thing is this. To be God-reliant and not self-reliant. What we see in this opening chapter of, of Daniel is the invisible hand of God over his people in a hostile culture. Yes, Yahweh sends them to exile, but Yahweh goes with them into exile. Yahweh gives him favor with, his, with the chief of staff. Yahweh gives him gifts that impresses the nation. Yahweh does these things. Yahweh makes them way healthier than all the people around them. Now, apologies to anyone who bought, you know, the Daniel plan, um, you know, books, you know, a Christianese, you know, diet book. But the scriptures are proclaiming that vegetables and water are the way to a healthy life. It's proclaiming the miraculous hand of God to make people on vegetables and water look fatter and healthier and more vibrant than people who on meat and wine. It is the miraculous hand of God to sustain his people who are looking to devote themselves to him in the midst of a hostile culture. God's hand is at work. The Lord who sends us to exile goes with us there. And he continues to provide for his people. And thirdly, the Christian fights the culture through Christ's means and not our own means. There are two temptations that strike us as we enter into Babylon. The first we've talked about is being enticed by its, by its you know, good things. Seduced by its, you know, niceties. But the other is this, to be hostile. It is be unforgiving and bitter towards the nation. And certainly you could understand why Daniel might be that, right? Bab Babylon came in. They slaughtered his family and his friends. They drug him a hundred, you know, hundreds of miles and maybe castrated him. They sent him into these re-education re camps for, for three years. They changed his name. They profaned the, the temple of Yahweh. They profaned the name of his God. And they are calling to serve him now, and, well, we can surely see why that would make somebody bitter. But yet, what do we see? 
the gifts that God has given him, he uses them to bless his enemies and the enemies of his people. They bring him in for consultation. They hear his wisdom. And it's ten times better than his peers. That means when he gives wisdom, Babylon gets better. When they look to him for guidance and he gives good stuff, it means that the ones who subjected him put them under his feet. It's going to be better and stronger and more powerful. Yet he does it anyway. He's not being a traitor to the life faithfully lived with Jesus, but he's hearing the, the words of Jeremiah, who's writing to the exiles. And what does Jeremiah say? He says, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to Yahweh on its behalf, for in its welfare you'll find your welfare. That God is giving to, to the church, to his people, Gifts, talents, time, energy, money. And they are to bless those who might even be hostile to us still. That whether our our neighbors laugh at our Christian faith, whether they dismiss it, whether they reject it, whether their their Facebook posts are, are filled with things that mock and destroy, yet God has called us in the midst of a hostile age to bring blessing where there was cursing, where we received cursing. To offer life when we are wished death. To give goodness in return for evil. That's the way of the Christian, isn't it? That's the way of our Christ. Right? We who went in our ungodliness, we who in our wickedness, we who in our rebellion and sin... Jesus comes and offers us his life and his grace and his mercy. And God is calling us even now to offer this to a world, whether they like it or not, whether they like us or not. And perhaps you're feeling, perhaps we should be, a lot less like Daniel and a lot more like the nameless other eunuchs forgotten by history. That we have not kept ourselves from being defiled, that we've been seduced by either sweets or bitterness. That we have not been uncompromisingly faithful. We have not kept ourselves pure. But good news, beloved. God has given us a better Someone who who came into this world and was pure on our behalf. Who was uncompromisingly faithful to the word of God over his life in the midst of a hostile culture. In a hostile environment. That the maker of the world comes into the world not as, as king but as an exile. That we who are exiles might be brought in and share his inheritance. That God has given us a better Moses to lead us out of redemption not from Babylon but from the powers of sin and death that seek to rule and reign over our life. That God has given us a better David to set up his kingdom here on earth. That we who are living in the midst of a world that may be hostile to his rule and reign, yet God has given us his kingdom where his will is done and and his rule is experienced. He has given us what we talked about last week, the high priest who himself is pure, that we who have been defiled and seduced and embittered by a culture might be made pure and brought home. He has given us the hope of the prophets. As Isaiah proclaimed to the, among the captives, proclaiming the word of the Lord to those in exile, he, he says this in Isaiah 51, For Yahweh comforts Zion, comforts all her waste places. He makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon 
and they shall obtain joy and sorrow and sighing shall uh, flee away. Beloved, as we go into exile, the Lord goes with us and the Lord brings us out. As we face hostilities from the culture, they're overt or covert. The faithfulness of Jesus upholds us. Whether we've been seduced or embittered, the pure, righteous Son of God has come to make us pure as we look to him. That's good news. Pray. Holy Spirit, what we cannot do by our willpower, you can do by your by your power. Change our hearts even now. Fill us with your life and your love and your mercy. Fill us with a passion to proclaim your name in the midst of a culture that may be hot. And Father, we pray for this area, this region, even now. We pray for Elizabeth City and Hertford and Currituck. Lord, we pray for revival among our people. We pray for that this church, this people whom you have called, would be a light to, to the world around us. That even as the culture may be become hostile, that revival would break out among your people. That you would set free from the bondage of, of, of sin, of decadency, of, of a life that's curved in on, it, on itself and its own desires, that you would set us free through these people whom you have called, that we would be faithful through and through, we pray. And so, Father, be with your church. Let us not grow discouraged or weary or become seduced or embittered by this world, but, Lord, let your church reflect your life and your grace to the world, that your name and yours alone may be honored, glorified, and exalted. Lord, we pray, glorify your name here among us. We pray in the wonderful and the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.